Self-knowledge has a lot to do with your philosophy. And your philosophy has a lot to do with shaping your attitude. How you feel about yourself, how you feel about life, how you feel about your direction, how you feel about others around you, your attitude. You've got to know, you've got to gather up enough knowledge and information to know what's right for you. How do you gather up information? You can start with your own experiences. Develop your own attitudes and philosophies around your own experiences and the experiences of others. Take all of the information you have gathered and compile it, consider it, debate it, tear it apart, turn it upside down. Look at it from your own perspective and refine it to suit you. And most importantly, make sure that what you end up doing is the product of your own conclusion. Make sure that the knowledge that you are building is your own self-knowledge. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, believe, drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog and drive you into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt that. And here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago, help take something around the world, so can you. If I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy raising obscurity, so can you. If the millionaire team can do it, president's team can do it, walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. Here's the next one, worry. I'm asking you to drive worry into a small corner. You gotta worry some. All this negative stuff serves, serves some purpose, but the key is for you to be the master, not the servant. If it's two o'clock in the morning and your daughter's not home yet, best you worry. In New York City, if you step off the curb and one of those yellow taxis is coming, best you worry. But here's what I'm asking you to do. You be the master of worry. Drive it into a small corner. Don't let it loose. And I'm asking you to go home with some new faith and some new courage. I'm asking you, don't worry. Drive it into a small corner. We've all got concerns. And sometimes we all wonder. And sometimes there's a little crack of doubt. We worry a little, but I'm telling you, drive it into a small corner. Drive your worries into a small corner. I promise you from this platform, a couple of more enemies of the mind you got to do battle with in the summer. One is pessimism that tries to get you only to see the negative side. Of course, there's the negative side. Life is part negative. What else is new? If the glass is half empty, it is half empty. You say, I've been only taught to see that it's half full. Sure, it's half full. But it's also half empty. Can't you handle that? That's not too difficult. But here's what pessimism would try to get you to do. Believe that it's only half empty. And when pessimism comes to your mind, you've got to educate pessimism because pessimism is stupid. Pessimism tries to get you to believe that it's only half empty. You got to say pessimism, you've never been to school too dull and stupid to know. Of course it's half empty, but it's not only half empty, it's also half full. I'm asking you to be in charge. Be in charge of your own mind, be in charge of your own destiny. Nourish your distributors, nourish your customers, take care of your responsibilities, feed, nourish. But then I'm also asking you to do battle with your enemies. Take sword to your enemies. Whatever's gonna destroy those values, take sword to it. If it's worry, take sword to it. If it's threat, threaten back. Whatever threatens this body and its future gets threatened. Whatever's about to kill this body gets killed. I'm asking you, take sword to your enemies, whether they're on the outside or whether they're on the inside. Protect your family, protect your future, protect your values. Love, nourish, but also do battle with whatever's out there to do battle with you. Take some courage from some of those that have been through the battle. They've given you their stories on this stage. They've been through it. They know what it's all about. Take some courage from that. And in the summer, do battle and nourish. Now here's the last one in the harvest time, number four. Take your harvest and all that comes your way with full responsibility. Don't complain. That fourth season, complaining, 
I'm telling you, could ruin all of your chances. Complaining sometimes starts as an infection. If you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. You battle with it. In the harvest time, reap your harvest without complaint. It's your crop, you sowed it. You either made the calls or didn't make the calls. You wrote the letters, you didn't write the letters. You were steady or you weren't steady. You did it or you didn't do it. You put together a good day or you didn't put together a good day. Take responsibility when the harvest time finally comes and say, hey, it's my crop, gotta take responsibility for it. I do not complain. And then here's the next one. Do not apologize if you've done well. We offer no apologies when these winners that walked across this stage here go back to their communities. We offer no apology for making the kind of money they make. Because of the lives they touched and the people that they helped, no telling what would have happened if these people had not touched many people's lives, who touched many people's lives. When you go back to the community, all of you that were winners here, I ask you to go back with no apology because you've done your job well and you've given good hands to everybody you've touched. You deserve all the money. Next, under getting better, I just want to make you make this list of four words. Four words. First, we talked about getting serious. Second, get smart. Third, get going. Fourth is get better. And here's four good words to take home. One is absorb. Develop the skill and the ability to absorb everything. Be like a sponge like you've been today. This has been a good, serious group. I appreciate that. You've worked as hard as we have up here on this platform. You've rolled up your sleeve and you've gone to work and you've taken notes, and I appreciate that. Absorb everything you can. Absorb the sights and the sounds and the color. Guess what you're going to want to do? Go back home and invest this experience into other people's lives, and you can't in invest it if you haven't got it. So I'm asking you to appreciate the color. I'm asking you to appreciate the auditorium. I'm asking you to appreciate what's going on here. I'm asking you to appreciate each other. Soak this all up. Soak it all up. It's called absorb, absorb. Then when you get back home, you can give out. And you'll have an extraordinary effect on the people that you reach out and touch. Here's the next one. Develop the ability to respond. I'm asking you to be touched with the smallest of people's challenges. Don't just be touched with the challenge. I'm asking you to be touched with the problem. Let people's problems get to you. Let people's problems touch your heart this year like never before. Be touched. Let life touch you. Don't let it kill you, but let it touch you. The problems that are out there, people struggling with their economy, struggling with their health, struggling with their future, I'm asking you to let that get around your heart. Let it do something to you. Don't go untouched. Don't go unmoved. When you walk out of here, open yourself up. Don't build up the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness and opportunity. Take the walls down. Let yourself be touched by what's going on out there. Let sad things make you sad. As well as happy things make you happy. Let your heart get touched. And you'll have good hands then to take this product to the marketplace. Here's number three. Develop the ability to reflect. Long after this session is over, I'm asking you to go back over it one more time. I'm asking you at the end of the day, go back over your day. I'm asking you at the end of the week, go back over your week. Make that week more valuable. At the end of the month, go back over your month. At the end of a conversation, go back over the conversation. How did it go and what did you do? Learn by reflecting. I call it run the tapes again of your own experiences. And you say, why do that? Here's why. To develop the extraordinary ability to gather up the past and invest it in the future. What a next year you could have if you pay more attention this year. Soak it up, gather it up, and reflect at certain times what's going on and what's happening. We've got this extraordinary opportunity now. Let us not keep it. Let us share it. Let us reach out with a long reach, a strong reach, an unprecedented reach. Let us reach out and touch people not just with our opportunity. Let's touch people with our lives. Let's touch people with our experiences. Let's touch people with our heart and soul. Let's don't just touch people with a marketing plan and a distributor kit. Let's touch people with their health, yes. With an opportunity, yes. But here's a commitment I'd like to have you make to me. Let's help people with their lives, not just their health. Let's help people with their lives, not just their income. Let it be said if they were around us one week, one month, or a lifetime that when they got around us, not only did we talk about money, not only did we talk about product, we talked about life. 
We talked about getting better. We talked about becoming all that you can become. We talked about picking up a challenge. What's the best way out of a blue mood? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way out of a mental energy slump? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way to start solving your own problems? Talk to somebody else about theirs. Why? Because when you start talking someone else through their blue mood or their mental slump or their problem, you'll hear yourself say amazing things. You'll hear all the knowledge that you've gathered come out to help this other person. And it will ultimately help you by hearing it again. It just works that way. It's often easier to tap our resources for somebody else than it is to tap them for ourselves. Sometimes defeat is the best beginning. Why? For one, if you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go. Up. But more importantly, if you're flat on your back mentally and financially, you'll usually become sufficiently disgusted to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull out miracles. Pull out talents and pull out abilities and pull out desires and determination. When you're flat broke or flat miserable, you'll eventually become so disgusted that you'll pull out the basic essentials required to make everything better. And it's in the face of adversity that things begin to change, that you begin to change. With enough disgust, desire, and determination to change your life, you'll start saying, I've had it. Enough of this, no more, never again. Here's where the miracle begins. I've had it. Enough, no more, never again. These words and these thoughts really rattle the power of time and fate and circumstances. And these three things, time and fate and circumstances, all get together and say, okay, we can see that we have no power here. We're facing some major resolve. This guy's not going to give up. He's had it. He's done with all this nonsense. We better step aside and let this guy get by. Resolve. Inspiration through disgust. But a lot of people don't change themselves. They wait for change. Circumstances to change. The government to change. Life to change. What'll that do? Not much. These poor unfortunate folks accept their defeat and wallow in their self-pity. Why? Because they refuse to take control of the situation. They refuse to take control of their life, their career, their health their relationship, their finances. They refuse to take control and take responsibility and get sufficiently disgusted to change it. But if you are disgusted, if you are making changes, if this program finds you in the middle of your own personal slump, then I have some words to offer you. Your present failure is a temporary condition. It is only a temporary condition. You will rebound from failure just as surely as you gravitated into failure. Somebody once suggested to me in a bout of failure that I should tell myself that this too shall pass. I firmly believe that you're only given as much as you can handle, as much negativity, as much failure, as much disappointment. This too shall pass if you grasp for a new beginning, if you pull yourself up and move back into the world with a plan, so as foolish as it might sound, be thankful for your current limitations or failures, for they are building blocks from which to create greatness. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can become what you want to become. You can do it all, starting now, starting right where you are. Make it work for you, not against you. Make your failures give birth to great opportunity, not prolonged agony. Make your disgust lead to inspiration, not depression. The world will willingly sit by and let you wallow in your sorrows until you die broke and alone. And here's what else the world will do. The world will step aside and let you by once you decide that your present situation is only temporary. Once you decide to get back on your feet and make your mark. The world doesn't care which choice you make to stop here or to go on. The world doesn't really care. So you have to care. In your own enlightened self-interest, give a run at adventure. 
Keep your eyes firmly on the achievement, on your ambition, and not merely existence and self-pity. Make a commitment to excellence. And remember, it is your challenge, your own personal challenge, to use all your gifts and skills and talents and knowledge to succeed. Today, you still have a real chance to turn your dreams into reality, to make yourself into exactly what you want to be, no matter who you are or where you start from. That's why we should be doing everything we can to make the most of the opportunities that have been given to us. But I also say take care, or maybe even beware, because the stuff that really matters can get buried under everything else. The right stuff can get smothered under all the plastic and shiny metal. And what you've got becomes a little less important than what you are. I'm talking about character now. The ability to inspire yourself that qualifies you, that gives you the right, that makes you worthy to lead others. Does it seem to you that a lot of people are succeeding these days without the benefit of a strongly developed character? It does seem that way to me sometimes, but I think some very positive signs are beginning to appear. We're starting to realize that we'd better remember what got us this far if we expect to go any farther. I think one of the sharpest distinctions between people is between the small percent who look words up in the dictionary and the overwhelming majority that don't. I looked up the word character in the dictionary. I learned the origin of the word and then I just sat there for a minute and realized that in this case, the origin of the word just about says it all. Character is derived from the Greek word for chisel. And of course a chisel is a sharp steel tool used for making a sculpture out of a hard or difficult material like granite or marble. And a chisel is also used for stripping away waste material from an object, stripping away stuff that might get in the way in order to get down to the essential thing, the thing that really matters. You've got to chisel your character out of the raw material of yourself just like a sculptor has to create a statue. The raw material is always there. Everything that happens to you, good or bad, is an opportunity for building your character. Character doesn't refer to other people. It doesn't refer to having power over other people or getting other people to follow you or gaining favor with other people. Character is something that you have and that you are. You could be marooned on a desert island and your character would still be important. In fact, it would likely be very important in that situation. But charisma wouldn't do you any good at all. Charisma requires the presence of others, while character is all about you. Character is the person you are after you've chiseled and have gotten past all the unnecessary material to what's underneath. Person of character looks within for the true source of inspiration and energy. Powerful personalities often resist delegating authority but it's an attitude of character for a leader to refrain from making himself or herself the indispensable heart and soul of an organization. People of character are usually well loved by everyone around them, but they make it clear that their own first love is for the truth, even if it hurts. Character is the result of hundreds and hundreds of choices you may make that gradually turn who you are at any given moment and to who you want to be. If that decision-making process is not present, you'll still be somebody. You'll still be alive, but may have a personality rather than a character. And to me, that's something very different. Character isn't something you were born with and can't change like your fingerprints. It's something you weren't born with and that you must take responsibility for making. You may not be able to cross the Rocky Mountains in a covered wagon, but you can still create a better life for yourself by crossing the mountains of your soul. And that may be even a greater challenge. There used to be a joke about football teams that lost every game. 
The coach would say, we built a lot of character this year, didn't we? As if character is something that you settle for when you haven't achieved what you really wanted. Or as if character is something that automatically develops in you as a result of adversity. I don't buy that. I don't think adversity by itself builds character. And I certainly don't think that success erodes it. You can build character by how you respond to what happens in your life, whether it's winning every game or losing every game, or getting rich or dealing with hard times. You build character out of certain qualities that you must create and diligently nurture within yourself, just like you would plant and water a seed or gather wood and build a campfire. You've got to look for those things in your heart and in your gut. You've got to chisel away in order to find them, just like chiseling away rock in order to create the sculpture that has previously existed only in your imagination. But the really amazing thing about character is that if you're sincerely committed to making yourself into the person you want to be, you'll not only create those qualities, you'll strengthen them and recreate them in abundance even as you're drawing on them every day of your life. Since ancient times, philosophers have seen it as the basis of all real achievement. This is the quality of courage. A truly courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. Now, keeping in mind our idea that a courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way, let's ask ourselves if these fears really fit that definition. I think if we look a little deeper, we'll see that what really scares people about these situations is the sense that they're going to be helpless, that all their trust was placed in somebody or something, and now they've been let down and they can't do anything. They're helpless. But remember, you're never really helpless. And the sense that you are helpless, or that you might be if certain things were to happen, is something we really ought to be afraid of, and that we should refuse to accept. You're never just a victim of circumstances. No matter what happens, you're never without options that can get you back on track. It takes courage to recognize that because it means accepting responsibility for your own future. But I would suggest that we should accept that responsibility because no one is really going to accept it for us, no matter what we may have been led to believe. Let me emphasize that underlying most fear is the fear of helplessness, of being victimized or being blown around by the winds of fate like a leaf is blown off a tree. But is that really a legitimate way of looking at things? To me, it sounds like being afraid of the dark, in which case the best thing to do is to get yourself up, out of bed, and switch on the light. After all, the people who built this country didn't feel helpless when they faced obstacles that we can hardly even imagine today. Your fears are about not living up to your ideals, about reacting instead of acting, about not taking advantage of the opportunities that are always within reach. A truly courageous person is not afraid of what might or might not happen next week or next year. He fears not making the most of every moment today. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Demosthenes went searching for an honest man and he never found one. There was a time when telling a lie was very serious business. Lying was a very serious matter. It was also very serious if you accuse someone of lying. Today, a breach of integrity in a business matter might mean calling in the lawyers. But for hundreds of years in the past, calling someone a liar was the most common way to provoke a duel dishonesty was treated like a personal insult that demanded immediate redress. Everyone knew the big problems that could result if you got caught, so lying to another person took a certain amount of, what's the right word, foolish bravery maybe. But there's no such risk today, is there? 
Some people lie all the time without thinking about it. Most people know when they're being lied to, which they may find irritating, but they just accept it. Maybe they decide to become liars themselves. Many people don't feel the same kind of personal responsibility about paying debts promptly. And today, of course, we can put off paying for our purchases as long as we can make the minimum payment on our credit card. That pain that comes with having to shell out hard cash for something, the pain of maybe having to give something up in order to have this thing, we can avoid that pain. It's painful in just the same way that paying a big fat bill is painful. In fact, we even use the same words to talk about paying debts and telling the truth. We may talk about somebody's word being like money in the bank. We talk about being held accountable, about having to account for yourself, about being called to account. If you've done something that you're really not proud of and you're called to account for it, what does that feel like? How do you handle it? What are your options when you've got to explain something that makes you uncomfortable? It's a bit like that moment of decision when the credit card bill comes every month. If you want to pay off the whole balance, there may be some pain and sacrifice involved. You may have to grit your teeth. You know that your life will be simpler in the long run, but it's going to hurt a little right now to pay off the new golf clubs or the new computer. Or how about the 60-foot yacht? I don't actually know if you can put a yacht on a credit card, but I've certainly known people who would if they could. Gritting your teeth and paying in full can hurt. So quite often it seems easier to pay the minimum and delay the pain until next month. It's easier to float the truth of your finances off into a little imaginary plastic flying carpet and sail it into the mailbox. Of course, it's not really a flying carpet. It's more like a boomerang that's going to come around and hit you in the back of the head someday. What a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Maybe you think I'm being a bit tough here. Am I really saying that in every instance you've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So if somebody asks me, how are you today? I'm supposed to say, I gotta be honest with you, I have a sore finger, last night I had a headache, and I've got to admit that my foot hurts a little. No, that's not what I mean. In fact, I think there are many times when some flexibility with the whole truth and nothing but the truth is called for. However, planned lying, lying with an ulterior motive, lying for personal gain, that kind of lying is definitely something to be avoided. Remember what we said about courage? Courage is fearing the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Fear the temptation to misrepresent who you are or what you've done or intend to do. Trust who you really are. Trust your ability to earn the respect of others. Pay whatever price the truth costs. Pay that bill immediately. Because in the long run, it's a real bargain. When you're in a leadership position, whether it's in a business or as the head of a family, honesty and integrity are not as important as money or shelter or a telephone. Honesty and integrity are infinitely more important than any of those things. You have the choice of how you will be seen, but you will be seen one way or the other. Make no mistake about that. Leadership of a family demands even higher standards of honesty and integrity. And the stakes are higher too. You can replace disgruntled employees and start over. You can even get a new job for yourself if it comes to that. But your family can't be shuffled like a deck of cards. It might be tempting for the sake of consistency to assert that you should always tell the whole truth exactly as you see it in every situation. But I've lived long enough in the real world to know things just aren't that simple. Shakespeare wrote of one of his characters, every man has his fault and honesty is his. He is more honest than wise. 
Just as there is a difference between blowing hot air and premeditated dishonesty, there's also a difference between lying and recognizing the importance of diplomacy. How can you tell the difference? Your gut feelings will tell you. By the time we reach adulthood, I think most of us have extremely accurate ethical barometers built into our heads and hearts. We may choose to ignore what that ethical barometer tells us, but it's there nonetheless. When you're in a leadership role, I believe there's at least one situation in which you're almost always justified in stretching the truth to some degree. And here it is. You should overstate your degree of enthusiasm for your employee's work. You may use many carrots and very few sticks. Your recipe for dealing with subordinates should include at least three parts praise for every one part of criticism. Will this stretching of the truth cost you respect? I don't think so. Will a little sugarcoating of your true feelings foster greater productivity, better work, and improved morale? Absolutely. And that conclusion is supported by a great deal of behavioral science research. Praise is one of the world's most effective teaching and leadership tools. Criticism and blame even if deserved, are counterproductive unless all other approaches have failed. Vince Lombardi, the late coach of the Green Bay Packers, certainly deserved his reputation as a tough manager and a man of strong character. But even he knew the importance of building up people's ego. We can call it diplomacy or psychology or just plain flattery, but it often brings out the best in people and it's the grease that keeps the machine of human interactions functioning smoothly. So honesty is the best policy, but sometimes a little less than total honesty is even better. We've been talking mostly about the importance of honesty and integrity in dealing with other people, but I want to conclude now by focusing on what those qualities mean to your relationship with yourself. I think a term from clinical psychology is useful here. The term is cognitive dissonance. And I'll use a quick example to illustrate what it means. Let's consider a man who is an expert on personal financial planning. He makes a good living advising people about life insurance, trust funds, and the various kinds of mortgages. But a great deal of his business is devoted to helping individuals who have gotten themselves deeply into debt, who need to tear up their credit cards and start saving instead of spending. Sometimes there is no alternative but declaring bankruptcy and starting over. We are so surprised when one day this expert on personal financial planning says that he is going out of business. I just can't take the pressure anymore. It's too much stress. We can understand that. It must be stressful facing the problems of one person after another who's gotten into trouble financially to work through it with them day in and day out. But here is the big surprise. I'm the one who's in trouble financially, he suddenly admits. I'm behind on everything, even my car payment. And after lecturing about the perils of debt all day, I can't stand to look in the mirror anymore. Wow, this man is experiencing cognitive dissonance in an extreme form. He is trying to live with two conflicting images of himself in his head. And the strain is simply using up all his energy. He's fundamentally a good person. He really believes in doing the right thing. But that's the trouble. He knows he's living a lie and the stress of that finally gets to it. You might be surprised by the percentage of high-level managers and professional people who secretly know that they're presenting a false image to the world. The need to keep up appearances, the competition with peers, the pressure to make every year better than the last one, all this can make it very tempting to put on a mask. I'm not talking about just boasting here. I'm talking about creating a real split between what you're telling the world and what you know is the real truth about yourself. 
All the world's a stage, and to some extent we're all playing roles. But living with honesty and integrity can make it all a great deal easier. This is where ethics and psychology really overlap. Not only is it right to minimize cognitive dissonance, in the long run, it's a lot easier on your psyche. We all know people who have gotten ahead as a result of dishonest or unethical behavior. When you're a kid, you think that never happens. But when you get older, you realize that it does. But then you think you've really wised up, but that's not the end of it. When you get older, you see the long-term consequences of dishonest gain, and you realize that it doesn't pay in the end. I've seen people who have made millions with questionable business tactics, and I've also seen a higher percentage of health problems among those people than any insurance actuary could possibly account for. 